So anyways, both of them mm -hmm. have their own abilities and mm -hmm. powers. And, and, and which character is Dragon Ball? That this, this is Yoda and the Hulk. They seem kind of like twins to me. I mean, uh, other than the fact they're both green, I, I don't... And which one is uh, Genshin Impact? Wow, no, you've got to stop. Hi, I'm not an idiot. And did you really think I'd start a video about same face syndrome insulting Akira Toriyama? Nah, y'all are y'all are playing checkers and I'm... I'm gluing the pieces to the board. <laughs> same face syndrome, t-shirt, torso syndrome, they're really just two of the ways that artists end up with the incurable Incredibles syndrome. No, thankfully not. But they've combined and mutated into a sort of super bug contributing to artists' characters looking too similar to one another. Not in a cohesive and aesthetic or even functionally efficient way, but in a detracting, amateurish, using hair color to tell them apart kind of same character syndrome. There's a few reasons this might happen across multiple places in an artist's development. They might be more surprising or nuanced than just practice more, and it might be happening to you right now if you aren't careful. So I'll talk about this more at the end of the video, but the first link in the description below is something you can help me to help you with. It's a short poll about where you are with your art and where you'd like to be in the next 90 days. As a reward, you'll get a free wallpaper set from us and the knowledge that your answers will help shape Character Design Forge and the Learn Character Design course going forward. More on that later. So the first and most common reason for same character syndrome comes from a newer artist relying on a process or formula for drawing in place of actually understanding their subject matter. Now this process becomes so repeated and rigid and all the while they don't have the skill expression or visual vocabulary to venture too far out of the way that they've always done things. For example, what's the one way that everyone knows how to draw a stick figure? Well, with very little variation, all stick figures are drawn with this little circle like this, some amount of T-shape for the arms, and then an A-frame for the legs. It's almost hard to mess them up. Almost. With more complex characters, though, any attempt to do something different without really knowing how to do it will result in something that feels like a mistake, and so you quickly go back to what you know to be quote-unquote right. For example, to change things up and keep two characters from having same face syndrome, you might try moving the eyes lower or higher than you usually draw them on one of the characters, and then you quickly see that that was a mistake, they've got too much or too little forehead, everything feels off, and so you move them back. This particular example, and many like it, often come from things being flat and two-dimensional. There isn't really any real placement of the features in space in the drawing, and so they're arranged in a sort of amalgam way that feels right to the artist. Rinse and repeat that process across the cast. And then, because faces are only drawn this one way, any change of pose or angle results in, oh hey, there's that same face from the same angle again. Something to work on here is to study and use 3D shapes in your drawing. Not a new concept by any means, not even for this channel, but by knowing even which way a head is rotated, you can find the line of symmetry, know which pieces will go in front of others, and use the same amount of proportion knowledge to know what size and shape things should be, with a lot less guesswork. But for both bodies and faces, this brings us to the next way that characters can get too samey, and that's by being over-reliant on 3D shapes and rules. See, with construction, there's a vibe of correctness that we're searching for, accuracy, precision, and when paired with something like human anatomy, we can easily tunnel vision down on the correct way to draw characters. You might even break out the heads tall measurement lines to make sure everything is correct into that ideal standard. The problem with this is that humans aren't even all the same shape and size, and when it comes to character design and stylization, adhering to one core mannequin shape for our characters acts as a disservice to the very medium we're presenting them in. Often starting with these constructed shapes too early in the character design process leads to them being locked into a shape too quickly. Well, at least they're correct and realistic, right? Well, in actuality, shape is elastic, especially when it comes to a shape with indicators that tell us what something is. For example, a shape with a human face on it and a few limbs will read as humanoid to us, even if the closest realistic equivalent is far more complex or realistic. Spider-Verse Kingpin is a behemoth of a shape, and if the artists simply stopped at the reasonable human shape of Vincent D'Onofrio, the exaggeration and style of the movie would suffer, or at least not be as interesting. 
This is where people often hear something like this, uh, navigate mentally towards shape language, which is a vital part of character design, and go, okay, cool, I'm going to use round, square, or angular shape language with this character. And then they'll either just build a character using a circle or only use round shapes. It's a fine exercise to familiarize yourself with shape language, but there's so much more that you can do by blending and remixing these shapes and ideas. If you start getting gestural and think about the flow, energy, and weight of your shapes, you can sculpt, stretch, or mold them to get variety in your designs. This old Aladdin example gets used a ton, but being able to boil a cast down to a general shape of their silhouette means that no one's confusing the Sultan with Jafar from afar. And even beyond a cast like this to your overall body of work, it means that you won't maz Kanata the same eyes in different people, or uh, the same bodies for that matter. With t-shirt torso syndrome, every character is just a tube, a vessel to deliver the color or slogan or graphic of the shirt, which is good when that's Pikmin. It's the different hairstyles of the below the neck. And when they're combined with faces that aren't dissimilar enough, it can be hard to tell which character is supposed to be which. You actually give yourself a harder time as an artist because it forces you to draw each character more consistently, just to prevent the confusion of who a character is supposed to be. When broad shapes, overall silhouette, and elasticity are involved though, you can conform the shapes and proportions of those constructed shapes to fit a distinct, stylized one. Compare this older design of the Ninja Turtles, where the sole difference is their gear and the color of their mask, to the recent Mutant Mayhem, or even the Rise designs, which vary the body size, face shape, and proportion to make each character, which is still a bipedal turtle of a particular age, unique from each other all done with shape. There's a final way that both faces and bodies can bust out of sameness, and it's a word I actually don't really like to use. Like, I don't have a problem with caricature. It's more so the stigma, I guess you could call it, of the sort of goofy carnival drawings. It's neither here nor there, and I'm doing a bad job of explaining why I have a problem with it. But anyhow, the best way to understand something in art is to reference it. You can really never have too much reference, especially when you're studying. Now, through reference, you're able to study the real-life way that faces can look gaunt or full or long or chiseled or heart-shaped, and the way that human bodies can be short, muscular, obese, tall, or thin. But what this also means, though, is that having the knowledge of how something appears realistically will make your character designs twice as good when you go to exaggerate or highlight a feature about them in the ways of caricature. You'll know how that muscle operates, or how that skin folds, or the lines that the face makes during different expressions. It will make your simplifications of those features clearer too. So when you don't use reference to draw a character, you'll usually just rely on your mental library of something that you've learned to understand to draw before, which may not be that bad, but when you don't even have that library, you'll likely fall back to muscle memory of some sort. And I think that this same character syndrome is ultimately the floor or bottom level of what we're able to draw, kind of on the back foot or instinctually. It goes beyond an artist having a recognizable style or trademark element that crops up across their work. It's about getting variety and interest into your designs to make more of your characters more compelling to an audience. And of course, I know that this is way easier said than done. Each thing that we talked about here sums up hours and sometimes years of drawing knowledge. That's why we're doing something a little bit different today, because I'm asking you two questions that I sincerely want to hear your answers to. And in the description is a link where you can share your thoughts and get something in return, all because I need your help to help you. See, I lost something that I used to have a few years ago. In the course of gaining skill, experience, and perspective, something I don't have anymore is recency, a finger on a very specific pulse. If you ask me what is the biggest problem or struggle or thing I'm working on right now as an artist, there'd be universal and constant things like work on my fundamentals, warm up more often, do more studies. But honestly, my answers would include things like can I make enough to hire another animator for Stormfellers? How can I get more done in a week? Am I focusing on the right things professionally? Should I be seeking out more freelance? How can I provide more value on Patreon? You know, old people problems. Now, on one hand, I do feel like I've become a better teacher of art over the last few years of classes and courses and videos and critiques and mentoring, but one pitfall that any professional might fall into is assuming that the person you're teaching already knows something. Like, imagine asking for help and hearing, just draw it better like it is in my head, but, but you do it. 
ask any of my students. I'm, I'm always yelling at them like that. And I'd like to think that's not what I'm doing. And of course, I remember what it was like. But at the same time, I want to know what people trying to learn right now in 2023 are most concerned with, struggling with the most, caring about the most. What's your ultimate goals? What's holding you back the most? But don't say it out loud because I, I actually I can't I can't hear you right now. Um, I, I hate to interrupt. It's this isn't Dora the Explorer. So that's what the link in the description is. Over the next few months, we're going to start really digging back into what people want and need, drawing, character design, visual storytelling, really big plans, to be honest, including revisions and upgrades to the Learn Character Design course, which all existing and future students of will receive for free. And in return, you'll get a free wallpaper set just for helping us out to help you out. So those questions are, what do you want to achieve in the next 90 days? And what is your biggest struggle right now when it comes to uh, drawing characters and telling stories? And there's a quick context question in there so we can really properly parse out the meaning and sort responses better than just in YouTube comments. I can't believe I'm discouraging YouTube comments for once. And if you're encountering this video a little later on in the year, like a while from the upload date, still feel free to share. Uh, we hope to revisit your answers as time goes on to provide the best help that we can. Newbie goes backpack over on Patreon with Gelfric the Fruit Butcher and a small little child Ibo pin, which is just the right size to go next to their parent Ibo. Thank you so much to everyone supporting that, and the course is at learncharacterdesign.com. Thank you for watching, and have fun creating.